Hello, my name is Jorb. I love gear. Today we're talking about a synth that is a few years old and maybe has fallen out of public perception a little bit, but I still think is one of the best ways to learn about synthesizers and synthesis in general. This is Korg's original mini log. Holding it like this will not be the thumbnail. <laughs> You may be watching this video for a few reasons. One, you're already a subscriber, and you're coming back because you appreciate what I have to say, and I appreciate you doing that. Two, you knew this was going to be about the mini-log and wanted to hear somebody else's perspective, in which case, thank you for considering me. Or three, you're on the hunt for your own first synthesizer, and uh, the somewhat random tides of the algorithm sent you my way, in which case, fate has brought us together. Welcome, gear is my entire life. And this video will have value for all three of those groups, but there might be certain parts you do or don't care about considering your approach to this. And so I'm going to do chapters. If you want to skip around, feel free. I'm bringing those specifically because the tutorial portion of this is very long and very beginner friendly. So if you don't need somebody to step you through the parameters, you don't need to watch that part. I won't know if you skip around. In fact, if it makes your experience better, you should do it. But this whole video, what I'm going to cover uh, somewhat quickly, why I think this is a good starting place for synthesis. And of course, enforcement for that is sprinkled throughout the entire video. That will lead me into a walkthrough of programming and all the parameters, which is very beginner friendly. Then I'll round up with what it's like to buy used and some tips for doing that and what you need to be ready for. Sound good? Cool. Shall we focus on the mini log? About cool. If at any point you think to yourself, damn, this kid knows what he's talking about. That tells me you should probably subscribe. <laughs> and if you need a bit more convincing, I have a whole bunch more videos on my channel. Uh, and if you're interested in gear that's priced for somebody starting out, which I assume you are because you clicked on this, uh, a used DeepMind can be a pretty fine deal. And I have a ton of videos focused on that. Might even be my specialty. Alrighty, shall we focus on the mini log? Like I said, this is the second one I've had. I had one years ago, right before I moved on to the DeepMind because I wanted more voices. Uh, but it wasn't my first synth. I had a Micro Brute for a bit, and I had sold a few microcorgs, but it was definitely early on in my synth journey, and a lot of what I know now started uh, on one of these bad boys. Uh, and I know people are going to ask about the white pointers right away, so here's some footage of that. Uh, I dabbed a paint pen, let it fill in the groove that's already there on these knobs, let that dry for a while, which is important, you got to make sure it's dry. Scraped off some of the excess uh, with a tiny little Allen wrench, and then a final wipe down with a damp paper towel. Cool? That's the whole story on that. Anyway, yeah, they're not perfect, but that's okay. It's for me to see better, and especially if I'm talking on video, for you to see better. It's really, really hard to see where knobs are pointing, or especially before and after a change, if they aren't marked out at all, okay? Cool, that's a huge tangent. <laughs> Let's move on to the gear. Uh, when I say that I think it's the perfect synth, why do I say that? What am I really trying to say? First and foremost, this is the most important thing, use prices are hovering around 350 uh, and that's why it's part of this conversation still at all. If it wasn't affordable for a beginner, if it wasn't priced reasonably for somebody starting out, then it wouldn't be part of the conversation at all. And I'm not saying that $350 is nothing, but it is a believable amount for somebody to save up and put into a hobby, especially that had, even as long as these have been out, they've held their value essentially the entire time. When I sold one of these, gosh, was it three years ago? Maybe four years ago? Uh, it was about the same. I sold it for 350 when I was done with it, and I think I bought it for around 300 This, again, cost me... ...about $300. I can't keep getting distracted by it, even though I love the way it sounds. Uh, anyway, uh, knowing that it's kept its value so well, uh, if you lose interest for any reason, you can get a fair bit of your money back. Uh, more exciting to talk about. It's a good first synth because look at this. Crystal clear son of a bitch. Having an oscilloscope goes a really, really long way to helping you understand what you're doing. Being able to change a parameter and get visual feedback as to what that's doing can really help you put the pieces together in a way you couldn't if you were just listening to audio. And I do seriously credit this with the reason I bought my oscilloscope that I use in all my other videos. Being able to visualize really helps me understand what I'm working on and what I'm hearing. Okay, another one, something I think is very important. None of the parameters, uh, none of the controls are really that unusual. And people might say, ah, it's limited, ah, it's simple. But I think that's all to its credit. The options you have for like your filter uh, and your envelope and your LFO, whatever, are all labeled with what I would consider to be standard or the most common use, the most common terminology for all of these things. 
Uh, and I'm bringing this up, so to highlight synths that don't do that, if you look at, like, the Micro Freak, even if it is in a beginner's price range, and it really is, a lot of the functions and a lot of the terminology, uh, specifically within the oscillator types, can be confusing, especially if you're encountering that form of synthesis or sound design for the first time. And again, specifically with the Micro Freak, even if they are named the same thing, is inconsistent between wave types. That's really difficult if you're just trying to learn. And another specific example, the Minilog XD, the second version of this, the second envelope doesn't have a knob for sustain or release. To me, those are pretty much essential features for a polysynth to have. You should have full control over your envelopes, especially if they're a traditional standard four-stage envelope. To me, that's losing out on a ton of really like fundamental sound design option. And having it right below uh, on the XD, it looks just like this, tactic case sustain release for the amp envelope. Having the uh, filter envelope with half those parameters being right below it, it makes you say, why don't these behave the same way? Why aren't these identical? And other than panel real estate, which is a legitimate concern, I don't think there's a good reason for it. But to focus on the good, on this, the original mini log, the parameters are labeled what they are. There's no secrets. And without bringing up a few of my specific wants, you have access to all the parameters you should have. And it's all right here on the front panel. Yeah, uh, not to mention <laughs> that... There are very few parameters you get through through uh, the edit menus. And when you do, they're ones that are reasonable to hide behind a menu like that. There's no reason for them to be on the switch. Nearly every parameter is begging for you to reach out and touch it. Not per function. <laughs> Why didn't I write down not per function? Uh, with almost everything right on the panel, it really encourages you to experiment. If I want to try changing a parameter and it's something that's right on the panel, I can just reach up, give it a flick, give it a twist, and I'm already there. Cool. Okay. I feel like that covered that in enough detail. Uh, let's move on to our parameter walkthrough. And I am going to scroll off and back on. Here we are on an initialized batch. And I'm going to walk through this the same way I do for most of the synthesizers I cover, but with a little bit more uh, detail and everything, because I expect beginners to be watching this. Our sound starts with our oscillators. And unfortunately, the mixer is in the middle and not on the far left. But the mixer is independent volumes for each of your two oscillators. And so we're going to turn up just, just VCO1. And it is on a sawtooth, so the switch is accurate. And it's octave, returns to the middle here. And so those lights will always tell you where it's actually at. And so the other waveforms you have, here's your sawtooth. Here's your triangle. More low end, right? Here's your square wave. Cool, very different. And shape will do something different on each of those oscillators. And so we're gonna watch our oscilloscope already for the first time, how exciting. Shape on your sawtooth. Actually, let's go a little lower. You get sort of a mirror of it at the other end of its cycle. You sort of, you sort of phase in with a mirror of it until you end up with like an M. And think about the difference you're hearing. Understand what it does when you go from zero to full. Say some more high end here. When you have it about in the middle, you hear this sort of ripping, tearing. Especially while it's moving. And then all the way up. You get a little more low end, you get more lower harmonics. Back to zero. Cool. On our triangle, wave shaping is sort of wave folding. But it splits it down at its peaks. And again, understand what you're hearing. It's all it's all low end, almost just the fundamental. Uh, when we don't have anything going on with shape, and as we pull in, we get more high harmonics. That's sort of ringing. Wonderful. And down to the square, which is the one you're probably most familiar with, the shape. That is changing the pulse width or the duty cycle, and uh, this might be a little too nerdy for some of you. And you change your shape. So we have no change in voltage. There's nothing for you to hear. 
We call that pulse width on a square pulse width modulation. Okay. Lovely. And we have the same exact options for VCO2. And when we combine them by bringing both up in the mixer, right now they're on the same wave shape, on the same octave. Look at the way they interact. You see our pitches now are both zero. So they're tuned to the exact same thing. Actually, you know what I didn't show you? Uh, in global settings, here we go, parameter display, normal or all, I leave it on all. Because then you get to see a numerical value for any of the parameters you change. I think that's really important. Okay, we were talking about the two oscillators interacting. This is them lockstep with each other in the same waveform on the same octave. And if we change our pitch just a little bit, they start beating against each other. Uh, which can be very desirable. Wonderful. I will turn down oscillator two. So we have oscillator one on its own to demonstrate, and I'll bring up noise. Here it is on its own. Just because we're talking about the mixer, that's just white noise. Bring back in our oscillator one. Next section here is the filter, and you're probably familiar with these noises. You're probably familiar with these sounds, uh, even if you don't know a lot of the terminology, okay? Typically, with subtractive analog synthesizers, your filter will be a low-pass filter, which, as I turn down the cutoff, we lose high-end. And visually, the way that it looks, we have less pointy waves, right? We have less dramatic changes in... And already, I'm going to try and give you some... Um, already, I'm just going to try and connect some visuals to what you're hearing. So this is a sawtooth filtered. It's sounding closer to me to a triangle unfiltered. Even though we have a little bit of a volume difference. So we're, the shape we're drawing visually is a little closer to what we hear on the triangle. Same thing with the square. Cool. Back to our sawtooth. Okay. And as you turn the knob down, you're reducing the high-end content, and it looks like softer edges, softer peaks. Yep. And resonance is feedback at the cutoff point. We're going to do a full sweep. Okay, then we're going to add a little bit of resonance. Not a huge difference, right? Now you hear something, right? Resonance is feedback at the cutoff point. When the cutoff is all the way up, our cutoff frequency is really high, and I turn up resonance, here's some extra high end, right? And it also gets rid of a little bit of low end, that's just the way they work. Right, so if I leave it high to emphasize the cutoff, and then I turn the cutoff, we hear that emphasis sliding down to lower harmonics, lower frequencies. Cool, and if we go really high, That feedback is oscillating on its own and becoming its own distinct pitch. Even if I have nothing coming out of my mixer. Cool, okay. Let's get our resonance back to somewhere reasonable. <laughs> and turn our mixer back up. Okay, and these three switches down here, I will leave these low. And we'll stay in four pole, which is what we were in. Four pole versus two pole, how steep the curve of your cutoff is. And I'll put some visuals on screen, and I'm saying that, so I have to actually do it in editing. <laughs> but a four pole filter, 24 decibels per octave of your cutoff, of your frequency range, you'll reduce that much high end content. So as you go up an octave, you'll be reduced by 24 decibels. So for every octave, you're losing 24 decibels, right? 
but on two pole, for every octave you're losing 12. And so I'm going to leave it on four pole where we were, put it somewhere in the middle, and just flick between them. So we're on four pole now, and two pole. If you think of it as being less steep, and I hope I have visuals here, so a little bit more high end gets through, right? Because we're closer to that. And we are that. I'm leaving my hands in frame, but I know it's impossible to, to see what I was trying <laughs> to show you. So I'll turn up some resonance so we can hear it again. Leave our cutoff there. We're on four pole. And listen to how much high end we get back when I flick down into two pole. Cool. I like having that option. Some synthesizers don't. You don't even have that option on the Minilog XD. So we'll get back to where we were. About in the middle. Key tracking. What key tracking does is the higher on the keyboard you are, the more open your filter is. And so here we are. <laughs> With nothing. Here is 50%. You hear the difference? Here's 100%. And a low note. So somewhere in the middle, the note is where your actual cutoff is, and you're reduced as you go lower and increased as you go higher. And the reason for that is more of the note will be a high frequency when you play a higher note. More of the note will be a low frequency when you play a lower note. And so you don't have as much volume loss or change in character. And in a lot of ways, it makes the sounds more convincing or more natural, however you want to think of it when you're key tracking it up. Cool. Velocity is how hard you hit the key. I'm going to turn key tracking off. Velocity is how hard you hit a key will open your filter some. And so here is nothing. And here's all the way up. Really quiet, right? Really open. Low cutoff. High cutoff. I don't like the velocity curve of the mini keys. Uh, I don't really like the velocity curve of the mini keys. If I have it on at all, I'll leave it on at 50%. Key tracking, I will turn back on. Cool. On to our amp and filter envelopes, and I'm going to reset these to the point that we're hearing right now, which is just sustain all the way up. What envelopes do is they control your sound over time. When I hit a note now, it's just full volume while the note is pressed, and it's gone when the note is gone. And what an envelope generator lets you do, and this top one controls our amplifier, or our amplitude, the volume of our signal, the first stage, attack, is how long after I press the key does it take for that note to get to full volume. And we make it longer, so it takes more time right? And then our decay is how long it takes to go from that full volume down to a level, which we set by sustain. And so while it's all the way up, we won't hear a decay stage at all. But if I put this about halfway, so it's attack stage, time to full, decay stage, once we're at full, how long does it take us to get to this level, which I've set at about half. And let's make those both a little longer. Now while it's here, turn down our sustain so it's even lower. Okay, and what it sounds like with no attack. Think of what's happening, right? We're starting at full, because the time to get to full is nothing. So we just drop from our full level down to our sustain level. And it takes our decay amount of time. And release is after you let go of the key, how long does it take it for it to get back to zero? A little more. Okay, and that's all controlling the volume of what we're hearing. Think of it like moving this mixer knob automatically. That's all the volume of what we're hearing, but the second one is our filter. And so let's give it a roughly similar shape to that one, and I'm going to move our cutoff halfway through. So that's what it sounds like right now. If I add some envelope intensity or envelope, if I add some uh, envelope contribution to the filter with this is EG int, envelope generator intensity maybe, uh, and you'll feel notice if I go left, that value is negative, and if I go right, that value is positive. So let's listen to positive first and think of it the same way. We're automatically turning this knob, okay, according to the times we set here. Turn it all the way up. So our 
our sound is getting brighter as we move up. So let's move it into the negatives and bring our cutoff a little higher, even higher. We're subtracting the shape of this envelope from our cutoff. But let's bring our cutoff all the way to zero and give it some good, give it a good amount of and increase its contribution. Let's bring our tax down. There we go. Envelope is shape over time. One cycle of it starting with your key press. Your LFO is your LFO is a cyclical change over time. And there's three shapes. We're gonna start on the triangle. We're gonna point at something that's really obvious to hear. We're going to do pitch. I'm going to turn off our envelope generator for the filter. Just so it's a little more stable while we're listening to other things. And I'm going to point the LFO to the pitch. So as I bring up the intensity. Okay, sounds kind of silly. Make it a little faster. <laughs> and we can also point that to our cutoff, our filter cutoff. Or the shape parameter of our oscillators. Very exciting. And there's two more shapes. And uh, the triangle is the easiest to listen to because it's cyclical. It's very smooth, right? This is a sawtooth or a ramping down wave. And so we're gonna go from full slowly down to zero and then jump right back up to full. And so we'll do pitch again so you can hear it. You hear that it's descending until it jumps right back up. Or a square wave, which goes from zero to full suddenly. It's not smooth at all. Triangle is what I use most of the time. Because I'm doing boring things like adding wobble to my oscillators. Lovely. And there's also an envelope generator mod to the LFO. And so the envelope generator, your second one, this EG, can affect the intensity or the rate of that LFO. So let's listen to that envelope control the rate of this LFO. And let's point the LFO to cutoff. So let's leave it at zero. So that's what it sounds like. Let's put the envelope. And so the second envelope will control the rate of our LFO. And we'll just put it at all decay. So we'll just slowly hear it drop. <laughs> start off even higher. Hear that? It slows down a lot. And we can put it on the intensity as well. So a little less rate. And listen to that on pitch. So it goes from dramatic, since we're just decay stage here, to almost, go, since we're just the decay, decay sta stage here, right? It's just from full, slowly ramping down to zero. So it's a lot of modulation at first, and then it fades into nothing. And same thing for shape. Pretty powerful sound design tools. Cool. Okay. Now that we know all that, I'm going to come back here to the... So I skipped these earlier, but these are the complicated parts of the oscillator. We're going to come back there now. I'm going to turn this down and that off. That's our sound right now. Cross mod first. Cross mod will change the pitch of oscillator 2 as if oscillator 1 is an LFO pointed to it. So we're just going to listen to oscillator 2. Okay, and let's turn up cross mod. And 
when they're in when they're in tune, you don't get that much difference. And they do um, change a little bit because they are they do change a little bit because they're VCOs. They're imperfect. But I'm going to change pitch of VCO one. Bring it into a lower octave. And if we do the inverse, let's get this back to zero. If we listen to oscillator one while I change pitch of oscillator two, nothing happens. Just the same as it was. So cross mod only affects oscillator two. Okay, and because it's pitch modulating pitch at audio rates, it gets pretty complicated. <laughs> and it's mostly related to it gets pretty complicated, and it has some interesting relationships when you're barely out of tune. Okay, and so I'm going to bring in oscillator one and turn off our cross mod right now. So we're pretty close to in tune. I'm going to turn up cross mod. And we get more of that beating, but we're controlling the speed of it. Okay, and then after this, and then after we get that set up, I can change pitch of oscillator two. this sophisticated moving waveform all the way at the beginning of our sound set of our sound design here wonderful let's turn that back down to zero and get our pitches back in line let's listen to just oscillator two again we can point our envelope generator to the pitch of our oscillators. And in the middle, again, see that it's bipolar. In the middle is zero, and that C is sense. And positive is up to the left, and negative is down to the right. So if I turn it up a little, actually, here, here it is at zero. Here it is up a little bit. Because it's using this second envelope. Remember, we're just on a decay stage. So let's give it some rise as well. You hear that? <laughs> make them both slower, make it more dramatic. And that uh, sustain, since we're adding positive modulation with this, sustain level at zero is our starting pitch of our oscillator. Okay. And that is just oscillator two. If I turn up oscillator one, you don't hear it. It only affects oscillator two. Okay. That is per that is on purpose. So and then let's listen to it negative. Exactly what you would expect. So let's get that back to zero. We're gonna bring back. Okay. And now we're still just on oscillator two. I'm gonna turn on sync. And what sync does is every time oscillator one finishes a cycle, it'll reset the wave of oscillator two, okay? And so just like a cross mod, we're gonna to listen to that by just having oscillator two come through our mixer. I'm gonna change the pitch of oscillator one to see how it affects oscillator two. So here we are without it. Now it's on. They're on the same octave on the same waveform. And sync is in. You don't hear much of a difference, right? But as I change the pitch of oscillator two here, or even bring it up in an octave. You keep the same, you get the impression of hearing the same pitch with some other added harmonics. And that combined with our pitch envelope and just decay right now. complicated, really sophisticated, okay? 
So it's out again. Ring modulation. Ring modulation is very complicated as well. Ring modulation changes the volume of oscillator 2 as if VCO1, oscillator 1, was an LFO. And so let's turn it on with oscillator 1 in the mixer. No difference again. Okay, so it's down. Oscillator 2 is up. And again, because it's related to the pitch of both, those the way those pitches interact will really change a lot of what you're hearing. Because you're psych because you're modulating at audio rates. You get some really complicated interactions. You can get some, frankly, very complicated interactions. Cool. Okay. Well, we can do change the pitch from oscillator two as well with our envelope. Maybe we put them in sync as well. So this is sync and ring mod. You're almost getting formants. And that'll change depending on how we have how we have the waveform set. It's almost like speech. <laughs> anyway, this is in depth, and I'm showing it to you for two reasons. One, I want to highlight these oscillators are really, really, really good, <laughs> especially for something this cheap. They have a lot of dope options. Uh, even just the wave shaping. Even just the wave shaping, which seems totally like, oh, I'm going to change the shape. That's not normal. And those are options that are really, really, really cool to have on something like this. Sync is, is fairly common, but ring mod is not. And that combined with the cross mod depth and being able to modulate the pitch of oscillator too with the envelope, those are all really sophisticated options. And the way you synthesize things on the mini log, a lot of your action happens right here. A lot of your action happens with... Something that seems so fundamental <laughs> to a synthesizer. This is where a lot of the character in the mini log comes through, is the way the oscillators interact and the really, really, and the cool, complex options they afford you. Okay, that was a bit of an aside. We're coming all the way back, and I'm checking visually to make sure I didn't forget anything. We're all the way down to the delay. So I'm going to get set up a more exciting sound, and we're going to leave it back on VCO1. <laughs> pitch was way low. The delay is in effect. I'm sure you've heard it before. And so we're putting it on off of bypass and onto pre-filter. I'm going to time all the way up and just a little bit of feedback. Hear that? It is a little noisy and people will complain about that. <laughs> but let's turn the time down and the feedback up. Feedback will feed the signal back into the beginning of it. So more feedback is more repeats. Okay, and it can also sound sort of reverby, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Wonderful, wonderful sound. It's a little gritty, a little lo-fi. If I have any complaints, it's that the delay doesn't have an independent level uh, and that it is only good at being gritty and lo-fi. <laughs> I just demonstrated because I came across it. If you change time while you're feeding your signal back, it'll change in pitch because... We all know that pitch is frequency, right? And over, let's say, over a half second, your frequency was a certain number of peaks, a certain number of valleys. If you change the time, if you make the time slower, that same number of peaks and valleys is now taking up more time. So effectively, you're hearing a lower frequency. Fun to play with, and because it's here, it's easy to. Okay, the high-pass filter does the opposite of a low-pass filter. So we'll go back here. 
and our output is happening before the filter. If you look at this diagram, this output routing is not really related to the delay. It's really related to what you're hearing at the end of the synthesizer, right? And so if you look at the diagram, when I put it on pre-filter, that line right before HPF, so we're getting the output of the synthesizer before we go through this high-pass filter. Okay? And if I put it post, it's happening after it. So we can hear its effect on our sound. As we roll up, we get only high-end. Okay, just another synthesis option. The fact that it's paired with the delay, the idea with that is, if you have a pre-filter, that high pass only affects the delayed signal. Okay. And it's a little resonant, it almost sounds like. And so that it keep it a little less muddy. But in my experience, it only makes it more shrill. So if I'm using the high pass filter, it's on my entire synthesized sound. And if I'm using it for the delay, I keep it wide open. Cool? That was in depth. Oh. Okay, on to the voice modes. This whole time, we've been in poly, which means we can play four notes at the same time. And these diagrams are helpful once you think of it like that, okay? But, play four notes. As soon as I play a fifth, I'll lose one. So I'll just play. You can play up to four at one time. If you play a fifth, you'll lose one. Okay? Duo means you're using two voices per. And this voice mode depth detunes them from each other. So remember when we had our two oscillators on, and when their pitches were close, they started beating against each other? That's the same thing happening here, just with two of our voices. So think of my finger pressing that key twice. Two separate synthesizers playing that one key. When we do that on one synthesizer, <laughs> it cuts our voices in half. And so here we only have two now. If I play, so if I play two notes and then two more, I can cut them off. Okay, but if I keep myself to two notes, I get a much bigger sound. So if we go back to poly, and then duo, let alone with some detune. So if I have both oscillators in, bigger again. We're now hearing four oscillators per voice. Okay. Back down to just oscillator two. And unison is all four of those voices at once. Okay, you know what that means. We can only play one note at a time. And it's retriggering our envelope every time. If you don't want it, to retrigger your envelope every time, you can go to Program Edit and then change the portamento time to zero. And it won't retrigger your envelopes like it does when it's off. Hear that attack stage every time? That's not behavior I'm used to or is really normal. This is, I'm taking this bit exactly from Nick Bat <laughs> in his review of this. I remember that from years ago when I originally had one because it bothered me. Okay, so we'll put that off again. Actually, you know what? So we'll leave that, we will leave that on one. But here our voice mod depth is unison, is detune of those four voices. Now our other oscillator as well. Almost too big, huh? So we'll go back to one oscillator, turn this all the way down, mono. is one voice at a time. And why might I want to do one voice at a time? It changes the way you play, and it changes the result. So if you want, uh, so if you're composing a part that's just a single, you're playing a part that's uh, single note lines. If you're composing a part that's single note lines, or you're writing a bass line, 
can really help to put it in mono and it'll force you to play in a way that'll fit your composition. Okay, voice mod depth brings in another voice at a lower octave. Voice mod depth here brings in another voice at a lower octave. And I think multiple. Makes it huge. Chord mode. Play one note, it's like you're playing a chord. And as you change the voice mode depth... Changes the chord you're playing. I don't find myself using that much. Uh, delay. Delay is different from our delay effect. It will repeat what you play at a lower volume. A few times, right? But it still takes up one of your voices. So it can work. But it normally just feels kind of muddy. So you don't have great control. Don't find myself using delay very often. The arpeggiator. A synthesizer classic. And if you hold it, it'll latch. So I don't have to hold the keys anymore. It'll just keep going. Lovely. And our voice mod depth will change the order of that arpeggiation. From rising and falling and rising and falling to playing every note together. And that's synced to our tempo over here. Cool. Sidechain, I think, is very useless. So let me get... Sidechain, I think, is kind of useless. Because this last voice mode. So that's here we are. And I'm going to turn the depth way up. Can you see that? Turn the depth way up. It brings the volume down when you play another note. Isn't that weird? And so the depth is how uh, quiet it gets when you do that. So if you put it somewhere in the middle, it can be a little more tasteful than what I just showed you. But I don't, again, find much use for it. I live in poly and duo and mono more than anything else. Of course, the arpeggiator is fun to play with. But I think this is really where the mini log shines is doing four note polyphony. Cool. I spent a lot of time talking about that, and I hope that was helpful to you. I feel like that's covered ground. I feel like that's treaded ground, but sometimes having somebody new describe it to you is uh, all that you needed to make it make sense. So if even one person got that, if even one concept was clearer to one person, I feel like that was worth it. But if you skipped that, I don't feel bad. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I'm tired after doing all that. Let's talk about what it's like to buy one used. I've got Reverb pulled up on my phone right now, and I see 350, 390, 400 local pickup, and some other things. Those are all a little high, and I'm going to guess it's because the ones that were any lower have sold already. So these are the most recently sold ones on Reverb. I use Reverb first. I use Reverb the most because I know it's going to have the things I'm looking for. But if you can find a better deal on eBay or Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace, you should go with that. When I got this, it was a little bit dirty, so I cleaned it up. Uh, it showed up well-packed in a totally good shape. Uh, but just a little dirty. And if we're talking about buying used, that's something that can happen. So you're seeing footage right now of me taking all the knobs off and giving this a bit of a Windexing. Uh, and this is far from the grimiest piece of gear I've ever received. Uh, but after that little rub down of grime and oiliness, it feels fresh and clean and like it's something that is mine. And I spent some time on it now and I feel better about that, etc., etc. So you know what they say, leave it better than you found it, right? <laughs> so now mine has all these uh, pointers filled in and uh, it's a little cleaner than I got it. Anyway, that's another tangent. Uh, you've seen, I think you've seen that footage already.
uh, which is not uncommon, but sometimes things can be broken or have some issues. So it's important to be ready to ask questions before you commit to a purchase. One of the first things I ask and can normally lead to a lot of other things, ask somebody why they're selling it. They bought something else and they moved on, totally fine. They had a problem with this. You can even learn a little bit about the issues you might eventually run into. But if it has any problems or inconsistencies, you want to try and get that out of a person before you commit, especially if it isn't written out in the listing. Another few small things, chances are the presets will be from somebody else. So one of the first things I do whenever I get anything new, I save those presets off just to have them, just to preserve them. And then I reload the factory presets just to have it in the state that it would have been from the factory. And normally factory presets do a pretty good job of showing you what a synth is capable of. Or they can be really cheesy in the case of something like the MoFo. <laughs> Uh, but a couple other things you should be ready to check. So when you get something used, give it a once over. Just look at every corner of it, make sure it's clean and nothing's broken. And then as far as things to do right when you get it out of the box and it's all plugged in and you make sure it sounds right, a lot of the settings might not be on the default. Things like your MIDI channel on the mini log, a lot of the global settings can be changed. The global settings won't change anything dramatically, but if you run into an issue later, it might stem from a setting that you didn't change. It was just there when you got it. Just another thing to look for. That's more or less everything I wanted to say. Uh, there are some sneakier tricks. I think I'm going to save those for another video. Okay, so I'm going to go back to where we're running. Some of my preset patches here. Some of my patches I just worked up in the past couple days when I was enjoying this. If there seems to be an audience for it, I might do some more. Uh, specific programming things with this. But in general, I wanted to do a few things. I wanted to do a beginner tutorial on the mini log because I kind of think of it as closing a loop for myself. Uh, it's one of the first synthesizers I had that things really started to click for me. And that's, and that's really, really important to me and who I am now. So in a lot of ways, this is for myself. But I also think, truly, sincerely, in 2021, this is the best synthesizer you can get if you're trying to learn. Uh, they're everywhere. There's amazing, amazing resources all over the place, giving patches and sounds and advice and tips. Everything is available from, you can find coverage from Bo Beats, ranging back years and a number of other creators. Uh, beyond being good at what it is and being very hands-on, it's an interesting sound and unique of itself. And these oscillators is great. Cool? Okay. So a lot of what I said positively is true about the monologue as well, and it is available for even less money. So if that's where you're at to start, that's where you're at to start, and you should, and it'll be great. Uh, but as far as other polyphonic synths, let alone ones that are analog, I really don't think you can beat this. I could play with an arpeggio forever. <laughs> to quickly summarize, I think it's a good first synth for a lot of reasons, okay? In no small part is the oscilloscope. In no small part is knob per function control of your parameters. Uh, but in a more, uh, what's the right way to say this, sort of lofty way, it opens the door to a lot of other things. Because it is straightforward and simple, it makes you get to a point and say, why can't I do this? For me, one of the quickest, for me, one of the earliest things I got frustrated by was why can the LFO only go to these three places? It's so easy for me to reach out and touch any of these knobs. Why can't I point the LFO to more things? And that led me to something with modulation matrix. But for many synth sounds, you don't need that functionality. For a lot of things, this is much more than enough. I don't think the mini logs limitations, who said it? Did Mark Doty say it? Mark Doty said, don't ask a synth why it can't do something. Come to it and say, what can you bring me? And the mini log can bring you a lot. And a lot of the limitations aren't a problem until you learn enough about synthesis to know, I would like to do this, I wish this worked differently. And that's part of why I think this is a great beginner synthesizer. Because it lays these things out in a way that will lead you to a place of growth and it'll lead you to a place of learning a little bit more. Okay, maybe that's too lofty. Maybe I'm idolizing this, <laughs> but it is very important to me. I hope this was helpful to somebody. I hope this was helpful to anybody. I uh, really do love this. I'm going to keep it around for a while. I might chop it and make it a module. I'm talking too much. My name's Majorb. I love gear. That glues the mini log. You should buy one if you don't have one. 
Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. So long. I'll see you in the next one, okay? Have a good night.